name is Nina Sunday and welcome to Manage Self Lead Others. My guest today is Robert Pazzini, who's had a 26 year military career. He's been uh, in the US Navy. He's been a diver. He's been a master parachutist. He was an explosive ordnance officer. We'll find out what that means. A Bronze Star recipient. And he retired from the Navy and is now managing partner of iFly indoor skydiving Virginia Beach. There's iFly skydiving all over Australia, which is where I'm based. And uh, at his indoor skydiving facility, Robert turns the exhilaration of flying on a cushion of air in a wind tunnel as a team building event. He's got a program called Elevate Your Leadership and uh, it, it's inspiring participants to be a better leader and sharpen their focus on what's important. Welcome, Bob Pizzini. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And, uh, you know, uh, I love the international aspect of this discussion. Yeah, well, uh, we've just, just been talking about, you know, the, the fierce creatures of Australia. And uh, <laughs> I think you've seen some fierceness in your in your in your combat duty. So uh, congratulations on earning the Bronze Star. I mean, that is an awesome achievement. So thank you that. very much. Uh, a team effort across the board. And of course, if you're in the US Navy, my, my father actually was a ship's captain. He was in the US Navy and then was that's in fact how he met my mother on as in US lines. He used to travel the New York to Australia uh, line through the Panama Canal. So uh, a lucky, bit of lucky uh, guy. marine experience runs in the family. <laughs> yeah, great. That's great. Lucky, lucky fella. Yeah. So um, what's one thing leaders need to know about leading their people? One thing I could narrow it down to is leadership is imperfect and people are imperfect yeah. and leaders will make mistakes and those they lead will make mistakes. Um, and if we assume the positive in those mistakes, in other words, there was not malicious intent. And it's been my experience that 95% of the time there is not malicious intent. Um, the mistake happened for some other reason. Uh, it's easy to find a lasting resolution very quickly. So the one thing they need to know is you as a leader will make mistakes and those you lead will make mistakes. And how we deal with that uh, is what enables us to succeed or something else. Well, of course, there's this uh, mistake based learning that can happen in the workplace where you forget as a leader, you forgive people for making a mistake as long as you can gain a commitment that they'll learn from that mistake and not do it again and, and do that. Would that, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, to have uh, that deliberate of a discussion, I think uh, may not be necessary. Um, if, if people's moral and ethical character is well-placed, if they own the mistake, if they own up to the mistake and, um, and truly truly want to learn and, and not repeat that mistake. I mean, that though, all those good things present themselves. And, and so, so yeah, it's another way of saying what you said, but um, yeah. look more at the character of the individual, I guess, is what I'm saying. And from the leader's point of view, they have to be willing. Do you think they have to be willing to admit that they've made a mistake and made an error and not try and cover up every mistake? I mean, you don't want to be too self effacing, but, do you think leaders should be willing to apologize if if it's pretty obvious they've made an error? Without a doubt. Um, that's the quickest way to put that error to bed. That's the quickest way to put that error behind you. Apologize and move on if that's what's warranted in that situation. Absolutely. It, it takes a big character, a bit strength of character to be able to admit to a mistake in two people that they're leading, whether it be one on one or as a, a, as a team meeting. Without, without a doubt, it takes yeah. a bit of character and also a bit of reflection, introspection, or what I call metacognition. We have to think about what we said or what we did. We're going to say things that uh, we wish we wouldn't have said. We're going to do things that we wish we wouldn't have done. But uh, as you be become more and more experienced as a leader, ideally, those things happen less and less. They'll still happen, uh, but they'll happen less and less. Metacognition is the key word, Bob, 
because uh, it's it's thinking about thinking, it's reflecting right. upon what you said, the reactions of people. If if leaders aren't reflecting on the impact of their words, behavior, body language, they're not going to learn. Are they? are not. And it's been my experience that the weaker leaders are not metacognitive. As a matter of fact, I believe there's a study. Um, it's been a while, but I'm, I'm pr pretty sure there's a there's a university study out there that uh, that proves that. Absolutely. And that's why learning how to think, learning how to behave, learning what is best practice. Isn't that really the key to becoming a better leader? So learning is the key and lifelong learning is a key component of lifelong leadership. Um, it's just that simple. When we stop learning, our ability to lead is, you know, you, the days are numbered at that point. Uh, I want to be a highly effective leader. You know, I have 35 people on my team. I want to be a highly effective leader um, and, and affect the greatest amount of people over the longest term possible. So I'm not looking to, to hang my hat up and watch grass grow anytime soon. I've, I've got some things to do yet. And of course, uh, do you have a favorite book that people should read or, or I don't know if you've written one yourself? <laughs> so I'm about, half, yeah, I'm about halfway done with my book. It's called yeah. Elevate Your Leadership, obviously. Uh, uh, right. But, uh, but for books, um, there are several, you know, I give books away all the time. Uh, Sue Bingham wrote a book called The High Performance Workplace, uh, about 100 or so pages, a pretty easy read, but it's this simple common sense stuff that happens uh, in the workplace every single day. And, uh, you know, leadership at the end of the day is not complex. Now, I'm not saying it's easy all the time, but it's not a complex, complicated thing. Uh, you just have to approach it head on. Absolutely, Bob. And uh, when we've been doing leadership training about 15 years ago, it, was, it used to be about leadership theories, management theories, and we've actually flipped it and turned right into what are the behave, the eight good behaviours of a, of a manager or a, that to, to make them a leader. So it's all about really thinking about behaviour. I think that's doable. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Let me, I, I'll, I'll address that in a second. Let me, let me mention two other books real quick. Please. So, so uh, I, I believe the key components of the science of leadership are the following six factors, rest, hydration, nutrition, exercise, brain and heart health, and lifelong learning. And when I discuss those, uh, and those are key components of my leadership experience, Elevate Your Leadership. Those six factors are so interrelated, I, I express them graphically as a Venn, meaning if one of those factors is impacted positively or negatively, it will impact all of the others positively or negatively. So for example, if I'm not well rested and I'm not well hydrated, my exercise will not benefit my brain and heart as much as it otherwise would. Um, now I'll go back to the book because I read when I when I want to advance my leadership personally and I want to help other people. I read books like The Body Keeps the Score, which uh, was written by Basil van der Kolk. It's a book about PTSD. It's a book about um, um, addiction. It's a book about adverse childhood experiences. But more importantly, it's a book about how to pull yourself back, how to recover from those things and how to be a strong human being. Um, another one called Unstuck, uh, how, to, how to raise yourself out of clinical depression. Now I'm not clinically depressed, I don't have PTSD, but these books are written by researchers who help people become stronger mentally and physically, mainly mentally, but mentally and physically because there's such a connection between the mental and the physical. And what I'm hearing, if they're written by researchers, then it's evidence-based and it's good content, robust content. 100%. Now, I understand how you teach leadership. You have a rather unconventional style. <laughs> a little, little bird told me this. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. So my Elevate Your Leadership and, and my experience was born of two things. 
One is I was looking for leadership training for my, my leadership team. I have six people on my leadership team. And we did some of the traditional leadership offerings that are out there. And there's nothing wrong with those. Those are good. But they weren't addressing the things that I was taught throughout my military career as a leader. They didn't hit the, the basic repeatable uh, tools, things that you need to have in your conscious mind and, and leadership tools you can deploy on a moment's notice if you review them frequently, if you exercise them frequently, like a, a musician rehearses, an athlete practices or trains, leadership is no different. And the tools of leadership need to be revisited on a daily, weekly, monthly, semi-annual, annual basis. So I could not find um, the leadership development that, that I experienced throughout my military career. So I put together my own curriculum. I delivered it to my team. Uh, it, it was very well received. Um, they helped me. They helped me develop it even further, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. And people outside the organization saw what I was doing, and they said, "Take that to the market." But the very unique aspect that I have uh, that I haven't seen anywhere else yet is the fact that I do incorporate the flight experience at iFly Virginia Beach into wow. the leadership development and team building aspect of my programming. And, and you know, flying in a flight chamber, uh, it's indoor skydiving is generically what it's called, although that's kind of an oxymoron, indoor skydiving. <laughs> However, uh, what we do, and I see this every day, uh, we challenge ourselves. We do things that, you know, we haven't done before. We do things that seem a little bit odd, indoor skydiving. But when we challenge ourselves or get outside of our comfort zones, as, as uh, we hear all the time, really what you're doing is expanding your comfort zone. So Elevate Your Leadership was designed to, number one, deliver the leadership development that, that I was exposed to throughout my, my professional life. Uh, and then number two, have it uh, in a fun and challenging environment like I Fly Virginia Beach. Then COVID hit oh. and I had to go to the webinar. And that actually turned out to be great because then I get people from all over the world uh, and it's really an incredible event. You're absolutely right, Bob. We're not going back to 100% face-to-face because it's, we're actually able to expand our reach. I'm loving the fact that I can connect with uh, experts all over the world, whereas before I had to wait till they actually flew on a plane and came to Australia. And, and likewise, you, they don't have to just be in your state uh, right. of, of uh, Virginia. So they, is it you're in the is it the state of Virginia? Yeah, yeah, Virginia yeah. Beach, Virginia. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yes, I think we've all become more used to the virtual learning experience and now can see benefits. And in some respects, it's even better sometimes. I've always been impressed. I've got a couple of trainers that work work with me who are ex Royal Australian Air Force, and I've always been impressed by the military model of team development. And I believe that's that's what you share with people, the military model. Can you tell us a little sure. bit about that, please, Bob? Yeah, absolutely. So so the military model in the US military, but, but uh, certainly in the Australian military as well, um, the model is based on three uh, components, if you will, or three pillars, manpower, training, and equipage. So we call it man, train, equip. So whatever the task is, whatever that unit, whatever that business or that company is expected to do, you have to have the right number of people uh, on the team to deliver that product or service or in the military to, to conduct a military mission. So that's manpower. Everybody on that team needs to be trained properly. So there has to be identified training standards and there has to be a basic level of training an intermediate level of training and an advanced level of training. And that's professional development. So we have manpower, we have training, and then we have equip. That trained team have to have the right equipment to do their job. And it's the responsibility of leadership to, to fulfill all three of those uh, pillars, man, train, and equip. Uh, let's go back to training for a minute. So training, we have uh, basic sustainment and then advanced, right. but we also have training at the individual level and then what we call at the unit level. So again, my team 
the individual flight instructors learn their flight skills. Then they have to learn how they work together as a team to deliver the product. Uh, and then, and so individual skills, unit or team level skills, and then you have a skill set where you're inter interacting with people outside of your organization. So again, there's, there's just in that training pillar, um, there's many, many components that uh, leaders really need to pay attention to. And this is purely the military model. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I would say is a team has a life cycle. A team is always going through all four phases of forming, storming, norming, and performing. We're, we're all in various phases of those four phases of team development. And leaders have to recognize where that team is in that cycle. And you can, you can, turn, you can add pressure to increase performance. You can reduce pressure. Uh, you know, leaders, leaders then know how to, um, how to keep the team fully engaged. Well, that's very interesting about the life cycle of a team. There's also the life cycle of individual team members as they come on board. Because in my observation, because um, at one point I had about eight, eight staff and some of them were involved in sales. And I, one of the mistakes I made was thinking that when they come on board and they're all enthusiastic and I train them up and I give them my attention, then I leave them alone to do the job. And we have team meetings, but I didn't have enough one-on-one -on -one meetings. I, I subsequently look back and realize. And I've been very big about understanding the importance of these one-on-ones, even if it's brief, 20 minutes. And it's not stopping and having a chat at their desk. That's not what I call a one-on-one. -on -one. It's actually saying, we're going to have a, a check-in, we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, whether it be over coffee or whatever. And it's a chance for people to, to really get off their chest anything that maybe there's a... a a gripe that they have that they haven't expressed. Well, if they you can't get them to vent that, it's going to eat away at them, and then it eats away at your relationship. Uh, have you got any comments to say about that interaction? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's but there's so much to say about that. So first of all, you're absolutely correct. Uh, one on ones on a reoccurring basis, I think, are critical. And within that one on one, and again, this goes back to some uh, intelligence collection training that I've had. Um, you want to be in listen mode uh, as, as much as you can be. Let that person tell you what's going on with their life. Let them vent if that's what they want to do. Um, ask questions. You, uh, you know, oftentimes I know the answer. I know the solution. But I, will, I would rather have them talk themselves into that solution than me just point it right out to them. Because that's development. That's learning. That's that's a leader being a leader. You're, when you develop your teammates in that capacity, it's exactly what leaders are supposed to do. So that's the first thing I'll say about that. The second thing I'll say is when you're listening, uh, John Maxwell uh, talks about three levels of listening. So there's level one listening, which is uh, I'm listening just long enough for you to stop talking and then I'm going to say what I want to say. <laughs> level two listening is empathetic listening, being with that person as they tell you what's going on. So empathy, right? And to be with, uh, or, or uh, with to be with feeling, empathy, pathy, feeling. Uh, so, so empathetic listening. And then level three listening is empathetic. It's level two with the observation of body language. Does the body language agree with what the person is saying? So I think it's important in that 20 minute session that you're talking about to have one or two questions and just let the person go and, and ask a couple of, of uh, guiding questions if you need to, but, but let them tell you. And, and, and if you do it regularly enough, they're not necessarily venting or they're not addressing issues. They're telling you how good they are at their job. And uh, always give your teammates the opportunity to tell you what they know and, and their little victories and how, how good they are at their job. That's a, again, it's a wonderful tool of leadership. Yes, Bob. In fact, um, uh, a conversation I had recently was that some leaders, the, the meetings are all about the figures and the results. 
surely there should be some time put aside to acknowledging people's um, successes, celebrate quick, you know, small wins, uh, customer compliments, so that we've got that human side to team meetings as well as, you know, let's focus on results. Uh, is that just as important, do you think? Oh, it's huge because you need those positive customer comments because that's your source of income. And the more positive customer comments you have, uh, you know, the more income you have in theory. And it takes, it takes a team of people who are really good and really enthusiastic, uh, really happy to be doing their job. And customers notice that. And the feedback we get, if, if you look at our TripAdvisor and our Google reviews, so many times they'll say that, um, you know, that those, the, the customer service advisor or the instructor, they made our experience first class. They, they didn't deliver a product to us. They did it with us. They were in it with us. Um, and so, so we praise that for sure all the time. We have something called iShine dollars. So if somebody gets a by name mention in any of these reviews, uh, they get a little, a little bonus or a little perk from, you know, from in-house. That's very nice. That's very nice. And um, that you get more of what you focus on. So if you compliment people on uh, whatever they did right, whether it be, and of course, compliments can come from internal team members as well. In fact, I think uh, for a little while there, we had uh, a principle where you give each, each, body, uh, each person in the office uh, a little fish if they did something good at the end of the week, it was like a little voucher. And at the end of the week, we counted up who had the most vouchers and they got some sort of award. We kind of did this at one point, you know, so it, and it just creates that element of fun within a team as well. And I, I suppose leaders have to understand that we're human. We have to enjoy where we work. And it, some leaders just think, well, we're just here to, to get a job done. Well, maybe not. Maybe it is where we spend a lot of our time and we want human interaction and acknowledgement. We do. And, you know, if you look at uh, the surveys that are out there, this Glassdoor survey in particular from 2019, yeah. um, the number one factor in the workplace was culture and values. Uh, there were six items to select from. Culture and values was voted number one. The last item in the ranking was pay and compensation. So people want a few things out of the workplace. Number one, they want steady leadership. They want, they want reliable, dependable leadership. By, by the way, senior leadership was the number two factor. Yeah. So culture and values, number one, senior leadership, number two. Well, senior leadership enables culture and values. So they want to feel like they're making a meaningful contribution to the mission of the organization and they want to be recognized as good or expert in what they do. That's a meaningful workplace. That's where people show up every day energized and they're going to give it their all as opposed to somebody showing up and complying throughout their eight hour shift, you yeah. know, being in compliance. Absolutely, Bob, because it's all about discretionary effort. People will do the minimum that is satisfactory if they're disengaged. And there's all this research around the, the percentage of disengaged uh, employees in a workplace. If you're wanting uh, people willing to pitch in and really act like a team member and not count, you know, I did this, therefore, uh, just, just be generous with their effort uh, and their contribution. Uh, that really is what creates that esprit de corps, that spirit of, fear, uh, of team, team spirit. Would you agree? Oh, I completely agree. And, and that's where leaders have to be conscious of who gets credit. You know, leaders have to give the credit to everybody except themselves. So, you know, in, in my circle, in the CEO world and the Chamber of Commerce and some of the other uh, organizations that I, I belong to at my level, People tell me all the time, wow, what a great job. You, what a great organization. What a, you know, boy, you're just doing wonderful things, Bob. And, you know, I, I attribute it to my team immediately. Um, you know, those in the know, they understand that we have good leadership within this organization and there are people who know what good leadership looks like anyway. Um, but it's really important for me to 
uh, acknowledge the team and get, get what's really nice is when the team, when they complement each other, when they communicate openly on a peer to peer level, Hey, let me help you with that. Hey, what can I do for you? That is, uh, that's, that is what I would call the golden ticket. When you have that type of, of moral and ethical character within your organization, um, the, the water cooler problems and the stuff that takes you off task, the, 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 the things that drive leaders nuts, uh, those don't happen um, with, with any type of frequency when you have that level of engagement. Yes, I've been inside large bureaucracies before I started my training company. And I was also excited to join this big organization. And then everybody was saying, oh, it's terrible around here. I'm trying to get out. I've got to get another job. It's like, well, why are you here? I was yeah. excited. This was my dream job <laughs> in television. But everybody was complaining. I went, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> so yeah. you don't want that. You've got to actually make sure there isn't that po those politics under the surface that really eat away at uh, well, people's enjoyment of, of, of making that contribution. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, somebody said uh, a while ago, and I wish I could remember who said it so I could properly um, uh, attribute, but they said, it's, it's one thing if somebody quits and leaves, but if they quit and stay, then you have an issue. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, um, I've seen you refer to the blueprint of a team that a leader can develop the blueprint. Have you got a specific uh, definition in mind when you refer to that? Yeah, that goes back to the man, train and equip. Um, yeah, that's that's the basic blueprint. You know, that's a that's a starting point, right. uh, but it, but it's a fully developed uh, it's a fully developed destination, if you will. It's where we want to get to. All right, so we'll, we, our conversation is coming to a close. I've been finding it really fascinating, Bob, getting under the surface. Just finally, what's the secret to sustaining and advancing a high-performing team, in your opinion? So the secret is um, highly engaged leadership, and that leadership has two components. There's a art component, and within that art component, that leader has a solid foundation, a solid foundation. And that foundation has uh, some, some uh, key components, if you will. One is a leader should have a personal definition of leadership, their own personal definition. And think about that definition every day. And if you are performing within that definition, you are leading. And if you're not, um, why aren't you? So, uh, so, so again, the art of leadership has a foundation, then it has leadership styles and power types. And I'm sure you're familiar with, with what those are. The important thing is that, that leaders capture the few leadership styles or power types that, that naturally adapt to them or that they naturally adapt to. So that's, uh, those are key components of your foundation. So that's the art, then the science and the science is exactly what I mentioned earlier. Leaders in what I call mono, stereo, and surround sound, have to pay attention to rest, hydration, nutrition, exercise, brain and heart health, and lifelong learning. Mono is how am I taking care of myself? How do those six things apply to me? Stereo is how do those six things apply to the person sitting across the table from me? Is that person well rested? Is that person well hydrated? Is that person well nourished? Um, are they thinking clearly? Uh, when somebody comes in and says, oh, I, I can't get anything done today. I slept terrible last night. You know, some, some leaders might say, well, that's not my problem. Well, it is your problem because that person is not performing to the level you want them to perform to. So I, I, I would really get down to the heart of the matter. So, uh, so mono, how do those six things apply to me? Stereo, how do those six things apply to the people I'm interacting with? And then surround sound is, how do I really enable everybody to be well-rested, well-hydrated? How can I make this, make this available to everybody? Absolutely love your mono, stereo, <laughs> surround sound metaphor. That is so easy to understand. Now, you mentioned nutrition. Do you think a lot of people reach for sugar based food as a quick fix for feeling hungry what what do you want to say about nutrition 
Yeah. So what I'll say there quite simply is in America, uh, 70% of chronic disease is caused by poor dietary choices. And yours truly was guilty of that. My cholesterol was ticking up and up and up. Now I, I, I exercise every day for my entire adult life, you know, minus, minus a couple of days of injury or sickness or whatever. Um, so I didn't take the cholesterol warnings serious. And one day the doctor said, I'm going to have to put you on medicine and you're probably going to be on this cholesterol medicine for the rest of your life. Now, my numbers weren't um, alarmingly high, but they were high enough to where the doc says it's time for medicine. So that got my attention. So I modified my diet for 30 days and um, dropped 70 points off of my cholesterol, 70 points. So here's what I'll say about nutrition. It is literally the fuel that makes your body strong and effective and efficient. And it's the fuel that makes your brain um, operate with clarity. It's the fuel that makes your executive functioning um, really give you what you need uh, throughout the day. And, and the other part of that is energy throughout the day. So when it comes to nutrition, um, get with a dietitian or, um, or figure out a way to make sure you are eating nutritious meals for the most part. I mean, you know, we all have a cheat day or we all have some issue with food, myself included. But for the most part, if you just simply eat healthy, you will be energized and have clarity and avoid what's called the trough in the afternoon, right? You go have that heavy lunch, you come back, your eyes are heavy. That's called the trough. So Daniel Pink wrote a book called When. And in that book, he talks about the peak state, the trough state, and the recovery state. Uh, we we want to be in peak all day long. So uh, so that's a long-winded answer to nutrition, but you know, I, I don't so mean- So important. So yeah. important. And I'm always drinking water uh, throughout the day. <laughs> it's actually, so that's my logoed water bottle. That's actually oh. part of the discussion. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a formula for how much water everybody should drink throughout the day. Oh. So number one, do we know how much we should drink? Most, most people don't know the answer to that. And then do we actually drink that much? Even if we know how much, I know that I should drink three of these per day. This is a 32 ounce Nalgene bottle. I should drink three per day. Um, and even though I have one of these at home and one of these on my desk, I don't always achieve that. That's right. So but people, at least that's what you're aiming for. And that's a good thing. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And some days you, you, you achieve it better than others. That's exactly right. Exactly right. So the other thing about nutrition, we don't care what the scale says. We're not trying to be a bodybuilder. We're not trying to be a marathon runner. We're trying to have energy throughout the day. And we're trying to have mental clarity throughout the day. And those six things, um, you know, hydra rest, hydration, nutrition, exercise, et cetera, those are key. I mean, those are the key components to enable that. Yeah. Bob, if people want to work with you, how would they find you? Tell us, tell us about that. Sure. The easiest way would be to visit um, robertpizzini.com. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Robert, that's Robert, P-I-Z-Z-I-N-I.com. The, the, um, the, 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 uh, the web, website will be in, in the show notes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. So, so that's the easiest way. My email direct is bob at iflyvabeach.com. Um, and if you, if you go to the website and you get my phone number, I actually answer my own phone. So uh, if people want to speak nice. directly to me, I'm yeah. available. And your book, have you got a title for it or, or is that top secret? Uh, so it's, uh, that's an interesting question. So uh, I do have a title. The title right now is called- Working title. Yeah, the working title is called Elevate Your Leadership. Oh, it's ready to be published. Uh, no, this is this is the workbook that you get when you oh, attend my seminar. Right. Um, okay. But elevate your leadership. So being a military skydiver and now jumping out of helicopters, um, right. you know, uh, the metaphor elevate. But um, uh, but the book hopefully will be done before the end of the year. And uh, and we so will... depending on when people are listening to this podcast, your book might be available on Amazon and it would be a fascinating read. Bob, it's been thrilling speaking with you today. I do appreciate your time and thanks for joining us in the Manage Self Lead Others podcast. It's been a wonderful discussion, Nina Sunday, and thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> thanks a lot.
This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.